So, uh, welcome to lecture 3 of MCS 472 on industrial mathematics and computation. So, this is our third lecture on the Monte Carlo method. Um, so, it's the third lecture in the first week uh, devoted to statistical reasoning. Um, so, in the first lecture, we encountered the Poisson distribution, uh, very useful to model arrival times, and we will see now uh, how this can be used in a simulation. Um, in the first lecture, we encountered uh, the lifespan problem, um, and the lifespan problem is uh, the problem that we will simulate in uh, the second part and uh, we start out by estimating integrals uh, so when we were computing expectations in the last lecture then we were doing some integral uh, calculus to derive a formula for the expected loss uh, now the calculus might have had you a little bit worried but in this course uh, we will estimate the value of an integral. And uh, while that seems to be rather not so accurate as computing, um, then note that for high dimensional integrals, and when we consider multi component products, we are actually computing uh, multi dimensional integrals. So for multi dimensional integrals, Monte Carlo method is actually the method of choice. So as the title of this lecture suggests, uh, this is on methods. In a way, uh, this could also be seen, it is a mathematical computer science course, in a way this could also be seen as uh, more drifting into programming. Uh, and actually, if you have uh, seen a good data structures course, then you must have encountered the data structure, the queue, and the standard application of a queue is a simulation. Uh, so, uh, and indeed, uh, some of the material that I will be presenting today also occurs when I'm running a data structures course. Uh, so, in a way, it is told in a different story, in a much different setting. So this is not a programming course. And do not worry, we will not ask you to program much. Just, just, uh, just adjusting the posted uh, codes and uh, notebooks. All right, uh, what is the essence of uh, the Monte Carlo method? It is essentially running a random number generator and then passing that running that the results of the random number generator through some functions. Um, here uh, we will uh, demonstrate this with uh, the estimation of pi. Uh, so as you well know pi is the area of the unit disk um, and we could consider uh, estimating of pi uh, of throwing darts, uh, generating random numbers in a square, and the proportion of the darts that land in the circle over the total number of trials will approximate pi. So for the purpose of our simulation, we will do pi over 4. Uh, we can do pi over 4 if we work with the square root of 1 minus x square. But in the simulation, we will see that you may as well work with the entire square. All right, so that essentially is the main idea. Now, for computing pi here, for estimating pi, this is a terrible idea. Um, so this is not recommended for one-dimensional integrals, but for higher dimensional integrals, it's a very good method. How do we do this in Julia? Uh, well, 
we have the built-in rand function and that when given only one parameter uh, it when giving no parameters it returns one random number otherwise uh, when given uh, a number it returns an entire vector of numbers um, so uh, the simulation can be done in four lines uh, even perhaps less uh, we will generate uh, vectors of length 10 million um, and then compute the radius essentially of every point uh, so what the z does uh, the z computes uh, how far the number is from the origin so and and here now uh, we are in the upper quadrant in the first quadrant so I will multiply my estimate by 4 and you see that by this method by 4 uh, by running 10 million uh, points we get about 4 uh, decimal places accurate um, so this is simple um, but actually it doesn't really uh, so it's it's great to illustrate um, it's also a good illustration again of the uh, list or, or of the array comprehension. So the outcome of the test, whether the point uh, lies within the unit circle, the outcome of the test is true or false, and that gets converted in a 1 if it is true. So we will summing up all the ones, essentially summing up all the occurrences. And then you see the line before that, the uh, next to last coding line, we have the dotted operation. Um, you can take the square, you can multiply a vector by itself, but then you have to transpose. Uh, with the dot and the exponent symbol, we are indicating that this is a component-wise operation. And now, last and not least, so I'm reading of the uh, last three lines in opposite order. Uh, we want to suppress the output. And, and actually also the, the suppressing of the output is kind of indicating the vulnerability or, or the, the, the inefficiency, if you like, of this entire uh, computation. It is actually not necessary that we store the entire, uh, the entire vector uh, of all samples of all the points in main memory. Um, so actually, already on my computer with 10 million, there was some there was some delay there. Uh, perhaps if your computer is not as powerful, uh, or or try 10 to the power 8, then you you you, you will start to notice this. Um, so here we are uh, storing three very large n vectors of numbers. It's good for first computation. And, and, and that's actually the first exercise. Uh, so in terms of expressiveness, uh, it's really great. And it's another good illustration of array comprehensions. However, however, uh, if you want to do very long simulations, and suppose that you want to simulate, you run, you, you, we, we can wait for, let's say, uh, half an hour or so, then you will quickly see that the, 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 the 10 million should be extended to several billions or trillions even. Uh -huh. So, uh, the first exercise is actually a computational exercise. Uh, make this computation more efficient. Um, so here, uh, write an explicit loop. Uh, replace the um, rand of 10 million by a rand of one number. Or if you want to be even more sophisticated, uh, it might be worthwhile to consider doing your experiments in chunks uh, because there is vectorization so you have the inner loop in the generation of the rand but then you have the outer loop 
uh, and uh, the outer loop uses the uh, other counter and it might be that if you chunk things and say uh, batches of 10,000 then that could be the most efficient way to work um, but the question is here uh, how many decimal places in pi do we gain as uh, the number of samples increases and how far can you essentially go with this um, Okay, that call was started. Um, so, but this is an industrial map course. Uh, so, uh, the computational aspects are really cool and interesting. Um, but uh, that's main, and, and by the way, that's also important. Uh, in this week, we try to get uh, familiar with the computational environment as well. But here is our industrial problem. Um, it's called the newsboy problem. Um, a newspaper seller has about 5,000 people passing by uh, the shop who come in the shop uh, or passing by if it's the newsstand. And of those 5,000, about 100 on average uh, buy a paper. Now, at the beginning of each day, uh, the seller has to order papers. Uh, so the seller has to, the newspaper seller has to buy from uh, the newspaper company uh, a number of copies and the newspaper com company sends to every copy at 50 cents. Now the seller can make a profit of 25 cents for every uh, newspaper that got sold. Um, now there is no return. So uh, the newspaper company does take no return. So for every paper that is unsold, there is a loss of uh, 75 cents. All right, so the question is, uh, to maximize the profit, how many copies uh, should uh, the seller buy? Um, so you could say on average 100, uh, but does that really maximize the profit? Uh, so because there are these uh, deviations, sometimes perhaps even as little as 90 uh, people will buy your newspaper, and then you, 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 you may you, you may not have a good profit here. All right, let's try to answer this. Uh, first of all, uh, in the story, uh, let's try to get the probability here. Um, whether a customer, a passersby, sells and uh, buys a newspaper or not is actually a flip of the coin. Uh, and the probability is 1 over 50 or 100 over 5,000. So that's actually the probability that you will uh, have a sell. And actually, if you would run this simulation, you would indeed, uh, for 5,000, you would indeed uh, get to 100. In, in some sense, this is um, an equivalent of rolling the die, our first example of the first lecture. But we are not interested in the probability, which we know will be 1 over 50. Um, but we will run a simulation saying that we do it day after day. Um, uh, day after day, we will uh, do 5,000 coin tosses with a loaded coin. And uh, we will compute uh, for every day for the entire year, uh, so 365 simulations we will compute this and see uh, simulate the coin toss so you toss a coin for everybody who passes by and uh, that person buys or buys not depending on the outcome of the coin all right you see already if you're a programmer you see the algorithm naturally coming by so we have the days that's the outer loop. So again, reading the slide backwards. Then we have the second loop, which is for the 5,000 passers by. Here it is. Um, we have a function. So the function. Uh, so the I said that the outer loop was the number was the day, but actually we want to get the range. Uh, so we want to, to run our simulation. Once when we we always say the first year 
uh, we always buy 90 copies. We are very uh, reluctant to throw any newspapers away. We buy 90 and then we do this for the entire year. So the profit here starts negative. Uh, so we have to buy 90 papers, 50 cents. And then we toss our coins 5,000 times. Um, so we have uh, uh, the, the profit, uh, the maximal profit over the runs, over the number of papers and over the, the year. So every year we will actually have a profit, an average daily profit. Um, so we would also like to keep track of the index here, um, where that occurs. So the maximum of the index. Um, and then we have to keep track of the uh, papers that are sold. Um, so we will not flip a coin anymore if we are out of papers. Uh, so we keep track of the number of papers that are sold. So each time when we flip our loaded coin, so you see here the random number generator. So the random number generator in Julia generates a number between 0 and 1. You can make a loaded coin. Uh, so a fair coin would be testing whether it is less than 0 0.5 if it lies in the first half. When the probability of heads uh, that you have uh, a cell is much less, you, you, you have it 1 over 50. Okay, so you add up for every day uh, the profits and then you average over the days. Uh, so that actually will tell us uh, what's the profit uh, for 90 papers, uh, the daily profit over an uh, annual simulation. Okay, so here I spoke about the max index. We want to keep, we want to remember if you run our loop, we want actually to remember for which uh, number of papers did uh, the maximum profit occur. So we keep track of the maximum profit and for which number between 90 and 110 did it occur. Okay, so this is an entire function. So here I will run it at the uh, Prompt. I will show an, uh, an outcome, uh, but in the post Jupyter notebook, you will have this in a cell. Um, here you see the run, and uh, if you run this, this will turn out differently. Uh, so don't get alarmed if you see different numbers. And here it turns out that you will have to, and, and the recommendation is to buy 96 papers. But sometimes 95 might show up, or sometimes 97. So 365 is actually not such a, a large sampling range. Uh, so you could also um, extend, gain a little bit more confidence uh, if you throw more computing power of it. What is also actually interesting to look at, and um, this might be a characteristic for this type of problems is that the margin is actually not that wide. Um, so here you see that uh, the maximal profit is $22.52, but with 95, uh, it's $22.38. Uh, so the next largest and is $20.38, and that occurs when you buy 95 uh, copies. Um, so in some sense, you could also tell if you have to advise your uh, newspaper seller that if you miss by one or two, uh, it won't harm that much. So there is an, an, an exact answer, but there are fluctuations, and that will be apparent too in your simulations. Okay, but mm, good to notice is that uh, the, the margin, so the, the, the maximal daily profit from selling 96 papers is $22. That's one paper in the newsstand. Here is a very much related problem. Um, uh, grocery stores uh, have a lot of items. And in a grocery store, you may have a bake shop. Um, so, and we sell fresh bread. Um, so baking a bread takes costs uh, the baker 90 cents and can be sold at the same day 
for $1.40. Um, so the problem would be identical to the newspaper uh, if the loaf has to be discarded if it's not sold. But you can still sell at a loss. Uh, you can still sell at a 70 cents the next day. Um, so this is not bread that you stick in a plastic bag and it stays uh, good for months. Uh, no, so this is a real bakery store uh, that sells fresh bread. So uh, I plucked these numbers on the... Uh, I didn't, I've confessed here that I didn't uh, solve this exercise. It sounded like the number sounded like good. Um, so, but it could be that I'm ending up with a ridiculous number of loaves of bread that we have to uh, bake. But I would expect that it might not be much higher than 20. Also, the probability is 2 out of 30 here. Uh, as a programmer, and um, you can you can first, if, if, if you solve this exercise, you will already get credit by just adjust, adjusting numbers from the newspaper boy. So just uh, forget about the next day. Um, so you, you have to be a little bit careful with the number of sold. Uh, the, the model is also uh, assuming that customers are hungry enough that uh, they will take uh, the discounted bread. Or even they might be even say, hey, I, it's a bargain here. Um, so that uh, there will be as much demand for the next day bread than the fresh bread. Um, so th th this problem could still have been a little bit harder if there were different probabilities uh, for the fresh bread rather than the next day bread. Okay, imagine now, so these simulations are taking very, very fast, but imagine that you would do this for your grocery store or in your newspaper stand for every possible item. Then you can see that uh, Monte Carlo and uh, supercomputing and high performance computing that, that this is actually a very natural application. But also this is not this type of computational course. Uh, what is important here is that we can understand and formulate the problems. Um, understanding what the parameters are as well and interpreting the outcomes. All right, um, fine, we had a loaded coin. Uh, can we actually see so in statistics, you maybe, especially if you come from numerical analysis, where we like to compute things close to machine precision as possible, then uh, it takes to get used to. Uh, it seems like we have to do a lot of work and actually not really gain much. Uh, but so the thing is often, the imprecision is often baked in into, into our distributions. Um, so here, how do you uh, check whether your simulations make sense? Because random numbers uh, on a computer are actually quasi-random. They're never fully random. Um, so here you can get some experience with this. So the 1 over 50 is 2%. Uh, so if you do a simulation with a loaded coin, you get kind of a, a, an, an average of... Uh, 1.86 percent um, and sometimes it will be might be more than two percent uh, so there is variation in this as well um, histograms um, so in a way this is still um, in the week of statistical reasoning if you are still a little bit um, having difficulties understanding the connection between a cumulative distribution function and the probabilities, uh, then this is a very good exercise. Um, it's also an exercise as the rand n, where n stands for normal. So the rand n function will give us samples that are very useful for the lifespan problem. Um, now, in a way, uh, this is here checking if you make a histogram, uh, how close is this to the bell curve um, that we have encountered in the first lecture. Okay, uh, so the question is here, 
um, we have defined normality as 68%. Uh, so if you uh, generate 1 million random numbers, then you would expect for a good random number generator to have about 68 or 67% of those numbers, two-thirds of the numbers, to be within the interval negative 1 and 1. Why is that? Because the mean, the average is 0 and the deviation is 1. So what is normal to a statistician here means that you are like two-thirds of the population. Um, okay, and you can then also visualize with a count. Uh, so we have 61 bins. We can uh, simulate then the distribution, uh, the cumulative distribution function. Making a plot could actually be useful here. Um, all right, um, I have uh, spent 25 minutes in this lecture. I have to perhaps get a little bit faster. Um, so the first application is the mean, the average uh, lifespan of a multi-component product. Um, so uh, here we have a composite uh, product of n components. And we assume that the lifespan of the components is normally distributed with some mean and some standard deviation. Our composite product fails if any of the components are failing. So what is then the average lifespan of the entire, of the complete product? Um, so one would uh, think it's the average of the averages, but that thinking is actually not quite right because the composite product is not actually a normally distributed one. So there is a separate distribution that applies there. Um, here is an algorithm. Uh, so uh, in, in some sense, indeed, it is a this class is a computing class, but there are algorithms there also that we see. Here we start out from uh, N, capital N, so there is a little n and a big N. The little n is the number of components. The big N is the number of uh, simulations that we do, uh, the number of trials. So the simulation is that we take samples from our normal distributions and this simulates that we make a product and we know actually from the samples how long every component will last and uh, here you see we take the minimum so the little t's so the capital t's are the entire vector uh, the little t's are the numbers, so we take uh, the numbers out of uh, the sampling um, distribution. So we take the i-th uh, number out. Now I'm realizing that there is an indexing problem here. Um, so ti is for the i-th component, and uh, there is an index missing, a second index. So it should here, there should here be a J. So I will fix this in the final version of the slides. So but the big point is that uh, the simulation is taking uh, the minimum of uh, all the samples uh, of the lifespan of the end components. And then we average. We are summing and we are averaging. Uh, important here, I will not write down the complicated n-dimensional integral, uh, but this simulation algorithm sounds, it's a double loop, uh, but we compute an n-dimensional integral. So if you had to do this with conventional techniques of numerical analysis, you would need to have an n dimensional nested loop and working with an entire grid of points. So as, as actually in numerical analysis, we never made it into uh, multivariate integrals because it's, it's, it's quite complicated. Okay, uh, how does the simulation then work? Um, 
with the Julia function. But here now our Julia functions are a little bit more involved in the sense that they have the uh, parameters in there. Uh, so we are following, um, we are not actually following the algorithm in the pseudo code, but we have the essential parameters. So we have the means vector and we have the deviations vector. And that follows the little n. Um, so we have n components and multi components, and we have the big n. Um, so the little n is here implicit in the length of the means and the deviations vector. If you're coming from Python, uh, then uh, the difference between Python and Julia is that uh, you can provide uh, the types. Um, I, I think in, in Python 3.10, in the latest versions of Python, it may also be possible already. Uh, to give uh, types there. Um, so they are optional, but for clarity, it's very good to indicate the types. Uh, when you write programs, when you develop programs, please include the verbose option. Uh, here I'm presenting you, as in many programming classes, fully functional, fully working, complete functions. But it's kind of an illusion that this function was written all at once. Uh, so uh, if you modify some things, think about the verbose. Uh, um, if the verbose flag is true, you write some extra information what you did, what you thought that the function should have done. Okay, our functions are very, very small. Uh, so here they fit, and, and in some sense, I should say that it's also recommended programming practice to keep your functions under the 10 or 15 lines. Um, um, and, and three of the lines here are the printing. Uh, so the printing here, uh, do this for a small number of the big N. Uh, so do this for 10 samples. Um, uh, what is important here uh, is that the default, uh, the built-in rand n, works with mean 0 and deviation 1. So that's not what we want. We have our given means and we have our given deviations. So you see here in this uh, j loop, we are uh, adjusting the number that we are getting. So the rand n returns a number centered around zero, well, we add the mean to this, um, so the mean for the jade component, and we multiply uh, by the deviation. So each time we take the minimum, so we have a workspace, uh, a vector of samples, we take the minimum that gives us the lifespan of the product. Um, so in some sense, my verbose could have extended. So a better verbose would have printed also the lifespan after the vector of samples. Um, so programs are never uh, complete and completely perfect. Um, so the last uh, point that I want to look at, I want to point out is that we have the average and we have the standard deviation. In more technical statistical language, they are called the first and the second moments. Um, so we compute, uh, then we return uh, the mean and the standard deviation. Um, so the standard deviation is here computed by the square root formula. Um, we will see that the statistics built in standard uh, actually provides ways to compute this uh, from a vector of observations. Okay, um, so here is an experiment. Um, so this experiment calls the mean time between failures function. Uh, for, an, for two arrays, uh, so the means are 11, 12, and 13. So these are the average lifespans of the three uh, components. Uh, so the third component lasts longest, but 
actually has the largest deviation. So it could actually fail sooner than the other two components. Um, and, and that might explain why actually the expected lifespan is not that much higher than uh, 10. Um, so uh, this is kind of unexpected. Um, so multi-component, well, expected and non-expected. Uh, so if you put things together and uh, things are failing when one fails, then it might be uh, expected that the entire lifespan is less. Um, Okay, so the standard deviation uh, is not three, fortunately. Uh, so in that sense, um, our product is uh, recalling Takuchi lifespan, uh, uh, Takuchi quality control. Our standard deviation is not that big. Okay, so if you run this yourself, you will see different numbers. So in some sense, it was not good for me to uh, be careless with the printing of the numbers. Uh, so typically when you print out statistical results, uh, it does not make sense to print more than two or three decimal places. Okay, um, that was a very simple simulation. Um, Many, many products, and actually our bodies, have redundancies. We have two eyes, two kidneys, two lungs. Uh, so there are spare parts, so the backups. Um, and the next exercise asks you to adjust uh, the previous computation, where it's a little bit simpler. Uh, so the means are the same, but now the first two components are um, one is one is a backup of the other. Um, so if the uh, first component fails, the second uh, component serves as the backup. And you could see, you could say that the the you could do this with the mini max thing. So you could for every sample you take, you take the maximum of the first two. Um, so if you have a subset in your of components that are backups to each other, you take the maximum of the sample lifespans there. So that's in general. But here it is okay if you can do this for three. Um, so in some sense, the mean time between failure, the mean TBF function, might have been too general. So if you adjust this, it's okay to assume that the user will call this for vectors of size 3. So in, in some sense this is exercise 4 um, and this exercise might be a little bit easier than the previous one uh, with the variation on the news boy problem. Okay, um, last part and I have about 13 minutes to go. Um, my timing works out well. Um, we are considering the problem of uh, a checkout in a store. Um, so we want to predict uh, the wait uh, time in a store. Um, we can formulate this problem immediately in great generality. Uh, so we are still doing mathematics. And the wonderful thing about mathematics and statistics is that they have universal, they have very wide applicability. Um, so um, we have three parameters in our simulation. We have uh, the arrival time of the jobs. Um, we have also the size of every job or the amount of time it takes to handle a job. And then the number of processors. Um, there are variations. Uh, so I mentioned already the size of every job. Uh, if you think about uh, a checkout time in a store, um, you can assume, it's safe to assume, that um, the model of the job size is the number of items the customer has. So we, it's safe to assume that every item 
requires more or less the same time to process. It's just running through the scanner. Um, we have the number of processors, uh, but we could also modify this if there is one processor and there is the speed, uh, the amount of time that it takes to handle one job. Um, so in, in, in some sense, um, there are three parameters. One deals with uh, the busyness of the store, so how many requests that there are, and this can be translated in arrival times. Uh, there is the size of every job, uh, or the time it takes to handle a job equivalently. Then there is the number of processors, or equivalent also the time it takes for a processor to process one item. So there are, we can formulate this in a continuous sense. Uh, the three parameters can be formulated by time, or you can also formulate it by three integers. So there is, and also there is a mixture of this. Um, um, what stays the same is that we will use the Poisson distribution to model the arrival times and uh, the surface times, uh, so how many items uh, every customer buys, that can be distributed normally or uniform. Um, and there could be all kinds of uh, distributions. In some grocery stores, in some neighborhoods, the beginning of the month will actually have very large jobs and uh, in the end of the month will have small jobs. Uh, so that's something uh, that one has to take care of when it gets modeling into a real store. Um, it also may, may depend on the time of day. Um, one may assume that somebody who comes in very late uh, wants to have only a couple of items. So that's another data study um, that you can do uh, for the first project. Um, all right, the Poisson distribution here is again. Uh, the Poisson distribution um, is depending on a real number. Um, so, uh, but we can also take it as an integer number. Um, so it's actually the number of customers that you can expect in one minute or in one time unit. So in our simulation, the lambda will be an integer, uh, the number of customers that we expect. Um, um, it is not really uh, in this course, so this is not a statistics course, and uh, the justification why this is uh, a good distribution is uh, not in the scope of this course. Um, um, also, even uh, saying that uh, you get the lambda average out of this, and this is the standard deviation. Uh, I would, if you are interested in statistics, then by all means, uh, figure out why this is. Uh, but these are not type of questions we are asking in this course. Um, so we are using this distribution. And how do we use this? Um, well, either you could use this as a programmer. Uh, so if you are in an environment where there is no Poisson distribution, so you, you but you can work with a built-in random number generator. And, and you can always write such a, a random number generation later yourself. Then here is how you should a sample from a Poisson distribution. Um, and I cite here uh, the reference that every computer programmer should be uh, at least aware of the existence of this. So this uh, features actually within the uh, category of semi-numerical algorithms. Um, now, in this course we use Julia and there is the stats kit. Um, stats kit is uh, a package, or actually it is a meta package uh, that you need to install. If you freshly upgraded to uh, Julia, then, then 
um, this would be needed. So using StatsKit in version 1.7 in Julia will ask you, do you want to install this package? And if you, you, you will see that it, it, it involves quite many number of packages. Um, uh, so uh, in uh, next week we will consider uh, data frames uh, so you can work with data frames in Julia as well um, but after doing this or assuming that it is installed you have the Poisson distribution um, so you can make a Poisson distribution uh, with lambda 10 so the question mark here is because I copied and pasted and uh, there was something wrong with the Unicode installation and um, the lambda that showed up in the Julia session uh, shows here as a question mark. Um, but you see, and the most important thing now is that we can use the rand using this parameter p, the Poisson, uh, with um, average 10. We can simulate our arrival times. Uh, so if we assume that there are 10 customers per time unit, then you see that you may expect as little as 5, so as 5 here in the third time unit, or as many as 12. Um, so the standard deviation, the square root of lambda is rather large. Um, so uh, this could be the input to our simulation of the arrival times. Okay, now I realize that in some sense, if I want to be careful and explain everything, that I will run over time. Uh, so there is a flowchart here that demonstrates the algorithm, in which, by the way, I also flash up when I teach data structures. So this algorithm will compute a vector of waiting times. So the vector is initialized to zero. So the first arrival will not have to wait. There is a processing time. So the B is initialized with the first processing time. And then we will have a time. So in some sense, we simulate the progressing in time by going through our vector of arrival times. Uh, so each time when we look at the next arrival, we turn our clock forward or we, 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 we measure the difference. And if that difference is larger difference in time, so the little t is larger than the processor time, which is the b, then there will be no wait for the next uh, arrival. Otherwise, we will actually update the busy time, the B, and add that to the arrival time for the next customer. So that is the algorithm. Um, so if you have never seen this, then the one minute explanation that I'm giving here goes too fast. Um, but I hope that it will become clear if I show you the Julia code. In Julia, this can be uh, coded up quite um, efficiently. And the confusion might also be in the setup. Um, so what happens, how do we model this uh, when eight arrivals per time step come in or four arrivals per time step? Well, uh, often you indeed have that people collide but we live in a civilized society and there is queuing. Uh, so if there are five, four arrivals in one time step, we will say that the first arrival, will we will actually uniformly distribute them. Um, so that's another leeway that you have here. You can assume still that there are different distributions. But if nothing is given, assume that the four arrivals arrive at the same time. No, don't arrive at the same time, but that all the arrivals are kind of uh, distributed uniformly within a time step. So there is a setup uh, that will determine the arrival times. Uh, so And there will be a corresponding vector of the same size that will contain the number of items. Uh, so now think about... 
uh, the arrivals are the people who are lining up to the register and they each have a number of items in their baskets. And here is then the algorithm again for the flowchart. Uh, it's actually almost shorter than the flowchart itself um, and a little bit more carefully with the long names. So we will return a vector of waiting times. We keep track of the uh, processing time. So the busy is the number of uh, the time that the um, processor was busy. So this depends on the number of times and the speed. So the speed is a floating point number that is multiplied with an item. It's actually the time that it takes to process one item. So in the documentation this is lacking. Um, but I hope it is clear from the context what is happening. Uh, we are keeping track of the time, so the elapsed is the t in the flowchart. Uh, if the time between two arrivals is larger than the time that is needed to process an item, then we set the busy, we, the busy time to zero, otherwise we simply subtract it. Uh, so you can see that there is this uh, dynamic between the separation of the arrival times. So the more the arrival times get separated from each other, the larger the elapsed values become, the, the, the more the decrease in the waiting time, as busy decreases, it will never be call, go below zero. But then you also have uh, the number of items. So the jobs uh, actually store uh, the size. If the job sizes increase, then actually the busy time wait uh, goes up and the waiting time will goes up as well. All right, I'm actually running over time. Here you see the result of one simulation and I would strongly recommend that you consider the code that is posted. Um, either you can run this as I do here on the slide at the command prompt or you can do this within a Jupyter Notebook. So there will be a Jupyter Notebook that contains the three functions that we have seen today and how they should be used. Okay, my last slide is an exercise. Uh, so if you're interested in high performance computing, then job scheduling is very important and modeling this. Uh, so this is another queuing problem. Uh, if you are a system manager, uh, how do you satisfy your customers? How do you uh, divide up the queues? Um, um, so here we consider a simplified model. So this is an alternative to the servicing request problem. Instead of having speed, we now have M processors. So uh, you will have a vector of booleans that are indicating uh, whether a processor is busy or not. So you, you have a vector of booleans, of m booleans for m processors, and whenever is a processor is busy, you set the flag to true. Uh, you do this too with the elapsed uh, time, whenever and actually to true, and also you should actually have the, the, the job time as well there. Um, so they all operate at the same speed, the speed is still there, uh, but whenever there is a new arrival, you check actually if there is a processor available. Um, so the busy, or you could also see that instead of the busy, is now a vector of numbers. In the program, in the Julia code, it was just one uh, number. Uh, there is also uh, a modification here, assuming is that there is no wait, uh, there is no capacity for waiting, um, or, or too limited. Uh, so as, if there is nothing idle, you will reject the job. Um, so there might be situations where uh, keeping the rejections uh, low, think about the healthcare situation in emergency rooms, that actually you do not want a uh, rejection. Um, so instead of a waiting time, we will actually count the number of rejected jobs. 
Okay, so this concludes the first week, the first three lectures on statistical reasoning. I hope that the exercises uh, inspire you for kind of giving you the uh, impression of the problems that we are kind of can solve. Um, this is a computational class still. Uh, this should not be too heavy on programming. And unlike like other mathematics and programming classes, uh, all the exercises are actually more than open-ended. Uh, the purpose of the exercises is that they can give you um, a taste of the kind of projects that you can do in this course.